Hi, you're listening to the Modern Club Management Podcast with me, your host, Ed Chapman. This podcast takes the lived experiences and knowledge of some of the leading figures and thinkers from the world of club management and beyond, all so that they can become your teacher and elevate your performance. Whether you're looking to start a career in club management, are a seasoned club manager at a world leading club, or work elsewhere within this wonderful industry, there will be powerful messages and key takeaways that can help you in your career or personal life. Thank you for tuning in and I hope you enjoy today's episode. This episode is brought to you by Sweda. Sweda is the social learning platform that delivers high quality blended learning with human connection. Sweda is on a mission to revolutionize the digital learning space through restoring the critical element of human engagement that has gotten lost in online learning. The technology provides everything organizations or individuals need on one single platform to achieve meaningful long-term learning success. Using these skills helped me attain a job offer as the director of golf at Golf Digest, top 100 in the world ranked course after I completed their influence and communication courses. But don't just take my word on the 97% five star reviews it has had on Trustpilot for it. Try it yourself. All you have to do is email david at suada.com, that's S U A D A.com, and quote the Modern Club Management Podcast to claim your free enrollment onto the reciprocity course to start your journey to become a more influential and persuasive communicator. Welcome to the Modern Club Management Podcast with me, your host, Ed Chapman. Today, I'm excited to be joined by David Thompson. David is the CEO and founder of Swada.com, which is a social learning platform that blends online learning with the critical element of human engagement. David has built and sold a number of highly successful businesses in various fields within the financial sector. A passion for sales has taken David all over the globe And as a lifelong learner, he trained under the godfather of persuasion and influence, Dr. Robert Cialdini, who quite literally wrote the book on the subject. To deepen his understanding of this critical area, which we will dive into today and learn how we can benefit from an understanding of this field. David, I'm excited where that conversation will go today and thank you for joining me. I'm delighted to be here and uh, delighted to um, share some pearls of wisdom and hopefully help a few people with uh, some of my travels and my journeys and um, successes, hopefully, that you, know, that, that you guys will be able to have. Excellent. So can you, what got you into this side of it? What, what makes you care and makes you passionate about influence, persuasion, communication? I suppose growing up as a kid, um, you know at the time when I did I was a little bit slow and it took me a lot a while to learn things so to give you some kind of background uh, I'm half Jamaican half Scottish uh, went to school in the 1980s and um, I'm dyslexic so when I left school at 16 I'd got no qualifications also I'd been in and out of uh, a children's home lived in loads of different homes you know it was it was like life wasn't really working out for me and if you looked at me you'd have thought God, there's a frustrated young man that's never really going to achieve anything because academically they didn't have dyslexia back in the 80s when I was when I was going to school. It wasn't a thing that you could have. It was and it wasn't even mentioned. And so I was slow to learn things. But at 16, I joined the army and I learned about systems, processes, controls, left the army at 21 and uh, got a job as a financial advisor. And I started studying the science of influence and persuasion because my army thinking got me thinking, how does this sales business work? How do I, how can I be successful as a financial advisor? And, you know, and, you know, as you, as you grow up and you start to learn things, you learn that sales is not an art, it's a science. And so, you know, I, I started studying all of the different elements that sit behind sales and it changed my life. I went from earning 130 pounds a week in the shoe factory to 500 pounds a week as a financial advisor. And I thought, Oh my God, I have to keep this. I have to keep it. And, you know, life throws these things at you and you know as you go throughout growing up and you start to have kids you know i've got loads of kids i've got four kids in my family and uh, you know you want them to have the best things like private schools and you start to run businesses what you recognize is that you know you need to make some money and if you want to keep it you need systems and processes 
And so I needed to know what the science was that sat behind sales and also um, how those systems could benefit me, but also how they could benefit people in my business, how they could benefit, you know, um, the guys in the audience, how, what, what could they benefit from my pearls of wisdom? So what I'd hope today is I can share with you a few little takeaways that will um, and have, you know, of my 53 years on this earth made a big difference to my life, but also be, be able to make a difference to the listeners' lives in terms of getting people to say yes to them. There's something lovely happens when people say yes to you. And so that's that's the game, that's the plan, that's the outcome that I'd like you to walk away with. A few little things that help you to be able to understand the science of yes. Ah, excellent. So from your time, just putting out one of those aspects in the army, you were posted in, was it Northern Ireland? Yes, absolutely. What, what, what did you learn from there that you feel has helped you through your life and career and business since then? Is there any, is there a particular moment that influenced you? I, su- I suppose um, when you're in the army, what you learn is that you're not in control. <laughs> That's the first thing. <laughs> you're not in control. The army's in control. But the army's got wonderful systems and processes and so my time in the army taught me order structure control and discipline and like i remember one time in northern Ireland when we were in our camp and it was in a place west belfast and the ira followed fired bombs into the camp but they fired them into the top of the camp and they blew up in a field rather than the bottom of the camp where there was a barracks and um, <laughs> and, and so my, my discipline's always been that of a positive mental attitude and we sort of laughed at it you know, and I, we didn't think, oh my God, we could have died. We thought, oh well, they got it wrong. So I've, I guess I've always been positive and looked for the bright side of things. That's always been like my mantra in life. You know, how can we look from the right side, you know, glass half full rather than glass half empty. And so the army sort of teaches you that, you know, you didn't die, move on, look forward. And so, you know, from January 90, 1989, when the bombs were going off in the camp in uh, Belfast, you know, I guess I, I, that was one definite takeaway. And also they've got a system to make sure that your focus is on the right thing rather than on the wrong thing. Otherwise people die. Yeah, absolutely. Certainly critical stakes there. Before we head on to positive mental attitude, as you just mentioned, with founding SWADA, what was the, was there a key moment that set you off into that business? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I owned a financial services business that I'd scaled, systemized from my army background, and then successfully sold in a multi-million pound transaction, which was lovely. So I've done that. But then I started to look at what did I know and what was I any good at? And the thing that I was really good at was teaching other people. And then how did I get my good feeling? It was teaching other people. So when I was doing sales, when I was a financial advisor, I was often able to explain things in a way that was conducive so that everybody could remember them. Maybe it was I was a bit thick or something like that, or, or dyslexia. I don't know what it was, but you know that that was just that was my superpower, if you like. If you want somebody to explain it like a five year old could get it, give it to Dave because when he tells you it, you'll remember it. And so when I'd done that, I started started looking around, thinking, "What are you really good at?" And I thought, "You're good at teaching people." And during my time, I remember one time it was 2008, and for most people, you know, they'll remember the financial crash of 2008. For ours, it, it wasn't that. It was a Google crash. And I remember looking out of my window and it was a winter's morning, like November winter's morning. The leaves were falling off the trees. And I got an, a message from one of my um, my financial advisors saying, Dave, could we have a word? <laughs> and I thought, oh, no, I know what that meant. It meant he was leaving. And this guy, Jai, was who worked for me. I knew he was going to be leaving my business. And I was thinking, oh, God, not Giles. And I'd lost like probably 10 financial advisors in, you know, in a very, um, in, in, a, in a very short space of time because we'd lost our rankings in Google. And I thought, oh God, what are you going to do? But my positive mental attitude come up, well, you, you know, you, you'd, if you, if you look back on your life and you looked where you are right now, you'd be probably taking it. So anyway, I, I, I sort of thought to myself, I'm going to have to train all these new people coming into the business myself to make sure they're superstars because I knew I needed to recruit some new people. And um, I started teaching people the way that I taught people to buy mortgages, how to understand persuasion and influence. And so I guess that started me on my path of, you know, how do you train people to be superstars? How do you train ordinary people? And like Wellingborough was where my business was in Northamptonshire. You know, it was one of, you know, it was not very ordinary people. It wasn't like Cambridge or Oxford or Harvard or whatever. So 
I was good at teaching ordinary people like me to be really good at persuading and influencing. So that was my inspiration. And so, you know, when it came on top of my business, I thought, well, you're really good at teaching people, Dave. Maybe you should do that. Maybe you should teach other people to be superstars. Um, teach them the right mental attitude, how to frame, how to negotiate, how to influence. And so that was the inspiration behind Sueda, thinking about what it was that I'd done in the past that I was successful with. And then, you know, what could I do today? Nice. So I think that brings us nicely into positive mental attitude. But before then, you know, just to touch on what kind of why this is also important, you know, as in the club industry, I think how we're seen as managers within the industry by our board is so important and, and the frame around our image. And then as golf clubs, how we're seen within the industry against our competitors, this is all really important stuff, which is why I'm so excited to speak to you today about uh, the, the stuff, the knowledge you have and around influence, persuasion and, and how we can pull that all together. So let's start with positive mental attitude because that does seem to be the foundation of where we go with all of this one one of the big things is if you want to change anybody's mind or you want to persuade them it's the, the foundation stone the starting point is having a positive mental attitude but if you went out into the world and you started asking people what a positive mental attitude is and you know where it works most people would say well it's about smiling a lot and being upbeat and being nice but in reality, it's not that. It's not that at all. It's, it's, it's a whole different thing and it's its own thing. And it has an identity. A positive mental attitude has an identity. It has a description. And it's the reason why I care about a positive mental attitude is because I learned it from a guy called William Clement Stone. And William Clement Stone, you might or might not have heard of him, but he was the guy that was the creator of the Aon Corporation, A-O-N. And so the Aon Corporation, uh, multi-billion pound insurance business, and he created that on his own from scratch and became a billionaire. And he lived till he was 100. He had 17 kids. He was an incredible guy. And so he wrote a book called The Success System That Never Fails, William Clementstone. And when I read that book, Sitting in the Shoe Factory, I read it like it was the word of God. I thought, oh, my God, there's a system to be successful that never fails. Literally, I took it on board, literally. And it taught me about a positive mental attitude. And I thought, wow, OK. And because I'd had nothing and when I was sitting amongst those boxes, like 1990, Bobby Brown was singing about his prerogative. Sinead O'Connor saying nothing compares to you. And I was sitting there and the airway boots were around me. And there's a funny smell of leather in a shoe factory. I don't know if you ever haven't, ever haven't been in one. I was just sat there, I read 53 pages in a day and there was a guy next to me called Andy Mobs. He was like six foot three, big, tall, skinny, blonde lad. I was like, Andy, do my boxes. And he could pick up like six boxes of shoes and put them into a thing at one time. And he was doing mine and his. And I was sitting there doing something that I hadn't done before, which was reading this book about positive mental attitude and the role it played in success. And it was amazing. And so what I learned was that a positive mental attitude is the right mental attitude in any given set of circumstances, incorporating the plus traits of life, such words as hope, faith and integrity. That's the definition of a positive mental attitude. And I thought the right mental attitude in any given set of circumstances. And I thought when I'm in Belfast and the bombs are going off, they didn't blow up in, area, they up in the other area. Um, but then often if you ask people what the opposite of a positive mental attitude, they'll give you what's well, a negative mental attitude. And that the definition of a negative mental attitude is the wrong mental attitude in any given set of circumstances incorporating the negative traits of life. But here's what I've found. Rarely are people negative for any long period of time. We might witch, we might whinge, we might moan, we might not like life going away. But it's hard to be negative because our breathing gets shallow and we feel down. But what we do is we often knock around with or we stay with the best friend of a negative mental attitude, which is a thing called inertia. So we know that we need to go and speak to the club manager or the president or whatever, and we don't do it. We go inert. We sit there and we do nothing. And that's the opposite of a positive mental attitude. And so when we recognize that you need to be positive to be successful, it's hard to be negative. But the easy thing to do is do nothing about it. I know I should go on the diet. I know I should go and speak to them. I should do something. What, what, what happens is we go inert. And so what I found was understanding the definition of where you re where the land really lies. It's not about being positive or negative. It's about avoiding inertia. You know, and if you are going to be negative, do it for a short period of time. You know, try and schedule your downtime, but get back to what can I do? 
because it's only by taking action do you get an outcome. And the way you get an outcome is you tend to use a self-starter. So some people might not be able to get through a workout without music. So the music's their self-starter. Some people not, might not be able to get there without a gym partner. That, that's, that's a self-starter. Sometimes it's a person you speak to that just gives you a kick at the ass. Sometimes it's a friend that you talk to that you say, I've got this problem. And they say to you, come on, Ed, you're a superstar. You can do this, this, and this, and you get inspired and you take action. But the, the key to success isn't being positive all the time. It's recognizing when you're inert and then getting back onto that positive bandwagon by taking action. And so what I found throughout my whole life from reading William Clement Stone's book, the success system that never fails, the first cornerstone, the milestone, is getting your head on right and teaching people that a positive mental attitude is the right mental attitude in any given set of circumstance, incorporating the plus traits of life. It's about having hope that things will be better, faith that things will be better, and integrity that knowing you can do your best. But when you fall off that bandwagon, it's not good enough to be inert. You need to get yourself onto the positive bandwagon of actually doing something. Because only when you do something do you get something. And that's the key to success. Yeah, it's a really powerful message. Just, no problem gets better with time, does it? It's that we sometimes we feel like if I just sit on my hands and bury my head in the sand, it would just magically solve itself. And two days later, it's it, it 10 times does. worse. And, and sitting and rotting... Like if you get a river and it's stagnant, it starts to smell. That's what happens with problems. We go inert. They're like a river that's just sat there. It just goes stagnant. We need to get it flowing. And even if you have to go backwards to go forwards, doing something is always better than doing nothing. Absolutely. And self-starters are so powerful. There's a Navy SEAL podcast host I listen to called Jocko Willink. And when I'm out doing my cycle rides and I've got a really tough set and the last 30 seconds, my legs are killing me and every part of my body and brain is telling me, car you've nearly finished anyway you may as well just start your recovery set now you're fine and i just say to myself what would Jocko say and inevitably it's do the last 30 seconds <laughs> and that's that's what i use to get me i imagine he sat there looking at me just shaking his head going don't you dare stop <laughs> the right mental attitude i think a lot of us can sometimes think a positive mental attitude is that rah rah happy state when it's not necessarily, but it's having that positivity to move towards action is such a key part. So another part I really like within this, the world of communication, influence and persuasion is framing. As I feel that's, that, that's really powerful with how we see for ourselves, how brands use it. I mean, in reality, we see it it's all happening to us all the time. We just maybe aren't aware of it if we don't understand framing. So can you give a bit of an overview of, of the elements of framing and then we'll go a bit deeper? There's a, there's a guy called Martin Seligman. Martin Seligman. And he's, he's what's known as the father of modern day positive psychology. So how you can be happy up for it. But what, what he did was Martin used to, a Jewish guy, I think he was born in the 1930s and he's a psychologist, 1930s, 1940s, he's a psychologist. And what he wanted to know was when people were miserable, they're manically depressed if they're miserable, what was going on in their head? And what he noticed was um, in his book, he wrote, Learned Helplessness. Don't read it, it's a horrible book. But anyway, the book called Learned Helplessness was when people were miserable or down, they went through this ABC formula. There'd be an adversity, something would happen to them. They might be along, they'd bump their car. They'd believe my day's ruined. The consequence, they'd be pissed off all day long. They're like, I'm depressed, there's something wrong. And they would say, my life ruined. You know, adversity, their partner cheated on them or done something wrong. Belief, it's the end of the world. Consequence, that was what was down. And Martin did that. Um, and then in the 2000s, when he got to the 2000s, he decided that he'd start to study optimists to see what they did differently. And what he found was, things that happen to negative people still happen to positive people. So the manic depressants and those, so they'd be in adversity, their partner left them, they believe my life's ruined, the consequence slow down. But then what they would do is they'd do two further steps. And this, this is what's known as reframing. They'd do a D and an E. And the first D was a disputation. They would say, hold on a minute. They said no to me, right? But or this thing happened to me. My partner left me, right? That, that was what happened. My disputation, you say, well, look, you know, bottom line, um, Either they would try and look at it from a different perspective or they'd ask somebody else to look at it from a different perspective and say, well, hold on a minute. You know, I'm 
32 years old, you know, um, you know, I can go again, I can find a new partner, I can find something that doesn't want to spend the life of me, or I'm 40 years old, I want to know now. Last thing I'd want to do is get to the end of my life and find out that my partner had been cheating on me, they were, they were disrespectful, I'd want to know now, you'd always want to know. Most people would say if they were sat there in their bed next to their missus, you're 80 years old, she looks at you and she says, Ed, you never did it for me, for you, me, mate. I slept with half your friends, I never wanted to be with you. What would you say? What would I say to that? That is an interesting one. I'd, I'd feel bad that, yeah, you, you didn't have that communication where you'd be open about that and part ways and go and live a happier life. Yeah. And you say, how long have you known this? And you say, how long have you known this? So I've cheated on you since I was with you six months in and I've always known about it. I knew you weren't the one, but I just thought I couldn't be bothered to change. So I just messed around. You go, why didn't you tell me? So we'd want to know that. So if you think about it from, from, from that perspective, something goes wrong. You want to know straight away how somebody thinks because all we want to do is to be treated fairly. So anyway, so you've got an adversity, something's gone wrong, your partner's cheated on you, they've told you it's the end of the world, your golf club manager said no to you, your belief it's the end of the world, consequences, you, you like it's down. But then if you dispute that, you say, well, hold on a minute, I can do something about this. And what he noticed was optimists either did something themselves or they spoke to a friend. They'd say, Ed, here's what's happened to me. Here's what I have been thinking. But then somebody else that they'd talk to, either they would themselves or with others, they dispute it. It's like, hold on a minute, you're 32 or you're 52. It doesn't matter. And also, you know, now these people don't trust you. Maybe it's time to get a new job. Maybe it's time that you start to get somebody on side. Maybe it's time and you start looking at it from a different perspective. And that different perspective creates an energization and it creates a reframe. You start to look at the perspective. From a, you start to look at things differently. So we frame things all of the time right all of the time framing is how we view the world there's a wonderful story about a sports coach right where this sports coach goes uh, goes he's running this football team in america and two of his players um, the best striker and one of his center backs gets caught with these two young girls that are underage in the check training room they get banned from playing football right um and the coach is going into the cup final at the end of the year and so he rings up his psychologist his sports psychologist and he says to the sports psychologist Oh my God, you're never going to believe what's happened. Here's the adversity. Two of my best players have been caught with this young girl. My belief, we've got a cup final next week. We've got no chance of winning without them. Consequences are, oh, I'm so depressed, I'm panicking, I don't know what to do. The psychologist says, hey, right, look at this from a different perspective. Imagine you plan for this to happen, right? Reframe it, change the frame, change the perspective, change the point of view. Look at it from a different perspective, like this was the best thing ever and you'd wished for it. And so he goes away. Ten minutes later, he rings up his psychologist. He says, this is the adversity. These two guys have been cheating. They've been playing around. My belief, you know, my belief was it was the end of the world. And the consequences was I was down. But actually, now I've thought about it. I've got an old centre back who'd run through brick walls for me. I've got a young kid who's bursting into getting the first team. I'm going to give those the opportunity of their lifetime to play in the cup final. They went, they played in the cup final and they won. They won 2-0. Right? The benefit, the point of it is, it's not about what the outcome is. The point of it is, it's about um, the, the the fact that if you change your perspective, you can do something different and you stand the chance of a different perspective. And if you don't, you don't stand a chance for a different perspective. So we use frames all the, all the time to look at the world. And what we should ask ourselves, how can we change this perspective, this frame, this point of view, so that it's optimal and it works for us? It does, yeah. So within that, is that mainly controlling uh, your frame of the world or can you also use this to change people's frame of view yeah you you can so often right when we go to somebody else we, we start and we don't have a thing called a pre-frame so that was a reframe it was changing the perspective but there's a thing called a pre-frame often we're gonna i might come up to you and say ed you're not gonna like this right guess what you're gonna look at it so you know i don't know how to say this you know that there's bad news coming down the pipe and it's a bad pre-frame you know Whereas you can use good preframes. You say, Ed, you're going to love this. I've got some amazing news for you. It's not perfect, but here's what's great about it. Da, 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 da. Right. So often the way that we shape our message, the way that we put ourselves out first, right, changes our perspective and our point of view. So you think, how can I put this out optimally that maximizes our chances of success? And so we can use that with influence, right? So, which, you know, we'll talk about in a minute. Often, if when, when we talk to a client, we might say, I've got a board here that I'm trying to get motivated, right? 
And I'm trying to tell them about all the benefits of them moving in my direction, of, of them doing what I'm proposing the golf club should do. All right, here's what the benefits will be to the club. However, the biggest motivator for people is the principle of scarcity. Scarcity, scarcity motivates action. So it's not enough to tell people what they stand to gain if they work with you. It's often more important to tell them what they stand to lose. So if we don't update our um, water sprinkling system to the golf course, right, and we don't do that now, here's what we st here's what stand to lose. This is a unique opportunity. We've got a member that's offered to do it for us. We'll do it at cost price. And if we had to go out to the market, it would cost us three times the price. So this is a unique opportunity, and this is what we lose if we don't take it right now, right? So it costs us three times. So it's two hundred thousand now, or six hundred thousand in the future plus inflation and inflation's running at 22% if you're living in the UK come January next year. So it's like, well, oh, actually it's all right. So that's changing the frame, changing that perspective, changing the pre-frame. So how can I pre-frame it in a way? So if you don't do this, this is what we stand to lose. And we're bringing in some of the influence principles, um, which we'll talk about in a minute. Yeah, so I suppose a powerful thing there is it's the loss, isn't it? Because when it comes to yeah. behavioral science shows that we hate losing far, far more than we enjoy winning when it's the same amount. Yeah. So often when we, when we tell somebody something, don't just tell them what you stand to gain, tell them what you stand to lose if they don't work with you. Cause then that's like, okay, I understand it now. Here's what it is. And here's what we lose. If we don't, and don't assume that people think the way you think that's one of the biggest mistakes that people make. And then we'll come back to scarcity. You just mentioned there's two types of scarcity, time and number scarcity and is one of those more powerful than the other? So there's a thing called the principles of influence. There's a social psychologist that studied um, human beings to work out what cognitive biases they have when they're making decisions. We all, we're all biased. We, we like people that like us and we like our friends more than we like other people. So we have these cognitive biases and there's six cognitive biases. I'll, I'll just go through them. So the first principle is the principle of liking. We like to say yes to people they like. If somebody you like comes to you and they say, Ed, please, could you do this for me? You know, I'm your wife. I've got whatever, you know, you think, oh, I like her. So you want to say yes to her. Whereas a stranger comes and makes the same request, you're less likely to. Right. So the principle of liking is a really strong influence principle. However, and we know that, but we don't often don't know the things that create liking. So similarities create liking. Praise creates liking. Cooperation creates liking. And so, you know, we teach this within our courses, how to create that relationship before you try and influence. There's another principle of influence, which is the principle of reciprocity, right? And we want to say yes to people we owe. If, you, if somebody's done you a favor and they ask you for a favor, you feel like you owe them, right? And that's reciprocation. You know, somebody sends you a Christmas card, right? Even if you bought all your Christmas cards, somebody else sends you a lovely Christmas card and says, to, the, to, to, to Ed and to your wonderful family, have the most amazing Christmas. And they write you a lovely message you feel an obligation to go and get them a card, right? 100%, yeah. So we feel that, but often when we're going in and we're going into a meeting, we're trying to motivate a board, what we don't think is, what can I do to do these people a favor? How can I get it so they owe me? What can I do? And so a lot of people, uh, there's a guy called Benjamin Franklin, um, that was one of, it was, it was like a brilliant um, guy in the White House in America. He had so many favors he could call, call in. They called him the great cooperator because he'd get everybody to cooperate with him because everybody owed him favors. So you should work out what you can do for people using reciprocity. Um, the expert bias, you know, if you've got a toothache, um, chances are you don't go and see your mate down the road, you go and see a dentist. Right. If you want an operation, you wouldn't dream of doing the, 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 the operation yourself. You go and see a surgeon. Right. If you want to go on a plane, my guess is you want a pilot in there. You want to see an expert. So often what we do is we trust experts. Now, you might be the expert when you're going into a meeting, but you don't mention what your credentials are. Here's what my expertise is in that area. So the principle of authority comes in. This is what makes me an expert. And, you know, and then we're more, way more likely to be trusted. The next principle of influence that, that overcomes uncertainty is the power of the crowd. You know, we've surveyed 3,000 members and 2,998 have all said they want to do this. And you two, they're what you say. They're like, we're way more likely to go with a crowd, you know. And a story of this is I was in Las Vegas when there was a shooting in the hotel next door to the one that we were in um, in 2000. And I think it was 18. You know, there was, there, was a, there was a guy hanging at the window. He shot 500 people, right? And I was in the Bellagio. And um, somebody said, shoot her in the hall. And the, a crowd of people ran. It was like 
um, if you ever seen Lord of the Rings and the Army of the Dead, come, run through. it was like that. They ran through, everyone ran. And just because somebody had said and there was uncertainty. So if we're uncertain and we don't know what to do, even if you didn't hear what that, that other person said, if we see a crowd moving in a direction, it's there. So have we got a crowd? Can we create social proof? Can we overcome that? Um, and they're useful. So authority and social proof are great principles of influence for when people are uncertain. They say, listen, we're not sure if we should or shouldn't do this. How can I prove to these people I'm an expert? Or how can I get a crowd together? Relationships are about liking and reciprocity. They're, that's the core motive that moves there. And then the last two principles are the principle of consistency and commitment, especially in England. My word is my bond. I say I want to do something, I will do it. So we should ask people questions up front to get them to make commitments. Alternatively, the principle of scarcity is about loss framing and, and scarce resource. So if we think we stand to lose something or there's a unique opportunity or something's dwindling availability, it, 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 it goes down like crazy. But if you offer somebody something, let's say you can offer them something on a limited time basis or a limited number basis to say, look, we've got to make a decision before the end of July. Right. And if we don't know by the end of July, or the end of December, and if we don't know by the end of December, right, then we'll have missed the boat. Where if we say we've got one person to do this, right, and this person will do this, job, and they're going to fit a new drainage system to all of the golf course, right? But if they get a big job, they'll never be able to do it. So if we don't let them know now, tomorrow they might be gone. The one person is more important than saying the time period. So limited number is always more important than limited time. So, you know, remember that. And if you've got tickets to a concert, somebody says, buy these tickets within 24 hours, right? And otherwise they'll be gone. If somebody says there's 2000 tickets, somebody else could come along and say, well, I want a thousand and you want a thousand and then they're all gone. There's no tickets left. It does. Yeah. It's, I think it's, it's stuff we've we come across ourselves when we're being sold to or, or when we're seeing adverts. And it's, it is really powerful to better use this in our toolbox of communication. So I think you know, one common issue that club managers have or complain about in their roles is that they'll put forward really strong supporting evidence and data to the board and they can't get them to move in the direction they want. And if all the data and evidence is saying zag, but the board still wants to zig, then what do you feel could be some missing ingredients that you'd want to maybe pull out of that influence toolbox, maybe a couple of them that you feel could be powerful. Well, one of the first things to recognize is if it was all about data, right, and, and evidence, then nobody would smoke and nobody would be the other way, right? Because <laughs> we don't make decisions that way, right? We don't make our decisions. There was a guy called Daniel Kahneman who won a Nobel Prize in the field of economics for his book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. And uh, in that book, he was a psychologist and he wins, a, wins a, a Nobel Prize in economics, which is basically maths, because he proved that when people make decisions, rarely do they consider all of the available information. In fact, nine times out of 10, they, don't, they ignore the information and they make emotional decisions, not logical decisions. So we make decisions on how we feel not on how we think. That's why we, you know, at the end of the day, we think, well, I shouldn't grab chocolate, but I'll grab some chocolate. I shouldn't have the, that bottle of wine, but I'm going to have that bottle of wine. It's, it's about how we make people feel. And to make people feel a certain way, understanding the science of influence is one of the most important skills you can ever learn, understanding the cognitive biases and the shortcuts they take. So if we're trying to motivate a board, right, we should ask ourselves, right, what where we are on one of three ports right there's three stepping stones so the first stepping stone with regards to the board is about relationships you say how strong or weak is my relationship with this board do they like me do they trust me do they owe me right and if the answer is no to that then you've got work to do with principles reciprocity and liking you need to build a stronger relationship so what can you do before you go to the meeting to build a relationship with those people because it's a if it's a weak or non-existent relationship with the board then you're struggling right because they're always like to say, well we don't like ed so we're just going to pie him leave him out it's not going to matter if there's uncertainty about your proposition they think your idea is a good idea but they're not sure they still want to seek experts then it's consensus it's the principle of social proof or authority what can you do to bring in expert opinion on what you're doing and show you're the expert alternatively what can you do to bring a crowd into it 
because we say here's what the experts saying here's what everybody else is saying in here and we ask the question you say do you disagree do you dispute any of this evidence and if nobody disputes it that's overcome uncertainty but the last thing is somebody can think your idea is a great idea in fact it's the best idea this golf club's ever had and also um they think there's no uncertainty but what they don't want to do is they don't want to do it now they're saying look we don't want to do it now what will we do is we'll wait until after christmas until your granny gets off the bus until we have our 60th anniversary until we get the queen's funeral out of the way until 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 we talk about until and so what they do is they kick the app the the, um, the can down the alley like britain did with brexit like so many people do with so many things we go inert and we don't have that positive mental attitude we don't want to take that action so what we need to do in those instances is we need to use the principles that are going to motivate action and so scarcity is going to motivate action because we need to tell people what they stand to lose if they don't do it what's unique about the opportunity and that starts to invoke the principle of scarcity because as human beings we're hardwired to react to these principles of influence like so for example if we go back into the old days right what happens if you didn't get to the water hole in time right what happened you didn't get there you didn't get to the water hole in time all the water's gone what did what happened well, you're gonna die because you haven't got any water to drink okay what happens yeah. if you got cast out from the crowd if all the crowds there and they cast you out from the crowd you've got none of the crowd in the old i mean like thousands of years ago yeah what happens? gonna die gonna die as well if nobody likes you they don't let you in the crowd so these yeah. principles are hardwired into the fabric what happens if you're somebody that can't be trusted if you give your word you say you're going to do something you never do it right nobody trusts you so these are the, yeah. these are the core principles of influence that start to motivate people to want to think about how they can interact with you, with your business, with your organization in terms of their, their, their system one thinking, the shortcuts they take, 90% of the decisions will say, do I like this person? Do I owe them? Have they got a crowd? Are they an expert? Have I committed to make a decision to work with them? Do I lose anything? They don't realize it, but that's the hidden curriculum that's going inside somebody's body, inside their head, inside their mind. And when you can tick all of those boxes, go tick, they like me, tick, they owe me, tick, I've got a crowd, tick, I'm an expert, and they believe me to be an expert. Also, they've made a commitment because I've asked the right questions. And then finally, they know what's unique about the opportunity and what they stand to lose. What you'll find, and what I've found in my life, is this is the science of yes. Yes, 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 yes. People start to say yes to you. Not because they want to, because they have to because this is what goes on in terms of making somebody feel like they want to do a decision. And that's where we need to tap into somebody's feelings. Within that, do you find it people make decisions easier when they're presented with one choice or when they have some comparison between different opportunities, which then you frame in a way that makes your one seem the winner? Yeah, well, I mean, well, you know this, Ed, so I know, I know, and I know you know, know this. <laughs> Ultimately, if we look at somebody giving you one choice, then what it is, is shall I do it or shall I not do it? It's, it's binary. Do it or don't do it. They give you two choices and you've got a dilemma, then you might go and speak to seek expert help from somewhere else. But two choices is better than one choice. Right? And one's better than none. But two choices, I've got a dilemma and then I'll go and speak to an expert. But three choices are optimal because then you've got the illusion of choice. You say, well, I don't want that one. If you know what you don't want, you say it's either this one or this one. Also, the way you present your choices matters, right? So if you're presenting to the board, these are the three things that I, I'd recommend. Here's three people that I'd recommend, they're all good, right? And here's what they're, even if you've got a rubbish choice in there, right? Even if you've got a rubbish choice and people don't know what they want, they feel like they're involved, right? And they'll say, well, I know I don't want that choice, that's rubbish. If you've got two other choices to present to them, that their, their willpower goes down. They say, well, I don't want that. But since you've given me this, it's like you've done them a favor. They'll then choose one of the other choices more times than not, significantly more times. And there's research studies behind that statistically. If you present three choices, here's our opt here's our um, thing. We could do nothing, but if we do nothing, here's what we stand to lose. Think, well, that's not a good idea. And then we've got three ways of doing this. This is our optimal level. The bad news is it's the most expensive. The good news is it solves every one of our problems for the next 100 years. Our next step, best option is an intermediate option that does this, this, and this. And then we've got a cheap option. We pack up the lines and we do it. And they go, well, we don't want to pack up the lines and we can't do nothing. But it's either this or this. The way that you frame your choices makes a massive difference to the amount of times people will say yes to you. Too many times we present yes and they go, nah. Two, dilemma. Three, 
or I don't want that. So it's either that or that. I've gone pick that one. And that's what happens. And so that's how you should structure how you communicate with anybody. Here's what the options are. Here's your choices. You've mentioned questions a few times when you've been describing that. Let's move then into the category of questions are the answers. Can you give a bit of detail to that and some examples of the, of the different types of questions that we can use? Yeah. So there was a guy called Socrates that you might or might not have heard of him, a Greek fella from two and a half thousand years ago. And what he said was, if I ask a question or a series of questions to which a prospect will readily agree and then ask a concluding question based on those agreements, I will get a desirable response. And that's the foundation of trying to persuade or influence anybody. Nobody wants to be told this is what you do. Nobody wants to be told this is the best one. What they want you to do is ask them questions because then what they realize is their theory is either good or it's ill-formed. And also they'll know that you care because you're asking questions. So if you ask questions, you can often get people into a position that you could never get them into if you're going to tell them. However, if you start, and so we call it the say it, doubt it rule. If I say it, you doubt it. But if I'll get you to say it, then it's true. And there's no way you'll back out of it because this brings in the principle of consistency. So what we need to think about is what do we need to do right, with our board if we want to motivate them to, to, to move in our direction? And let's just say like something they're doing in, in my golf club, in North Hans County Golf Club, they're going to put a new sprinkler system in. And they were debating it and it's going to cost half a million pounds. I'm like, shall we do it? Shall not we do it? All right. So the first thing is we, they, they might ask if they think, well, what could we do? To, to, to get people to definitely want to do this this year. And we say, can we ignore the sprinkler system and not bother putting it in? Can we just kick that can down the road? Can we ignore it for the next 10 years? And I say, well, no, we're about five years now. They're saying we need to do it now. The expert report says we're doing now. And we say, so we ask them that question. So we remove their right to do nothing. You say, do we want to put in a new sprinkler system? We could have one and the greens looks all lovely. Do we want to do it or should we bin it? I say, no, of course we want to do it. Okay, so if you get them to agree that they want to do it and they want to do it now, we start asking questions. And by asking questions, we can say, well, hold on a minute, Mr. Chapman. The last time in the conversation on the 23rd of June at 6.41 p.m., you said to me that you wanted to put a new sprinkler system. We couldn't do it, whatever. Is that right? So when you start trying to get people to commit to you, you remind them of the questions that they've answered, that the answers they gave you that committed them to say yes. So think about it. How can you get people to answer a question or to, to, to give you a perspective, a point of view on a topic that you want them to do and just reverse hindsight? So where do I want to get them to? I want them to say they can't do nothing. They think it's a good idea. They've got this money in the budget. If they had done it, they'd be happy with it. So you struck, start stretching your questions, but you can't say it. You need to ask those questions in advance. One of the most important aspects with that is um, is to make sure that when you're talking to them and you're asking questions to get the right answers, one of the most important questions is you keep the people with you right? You keep the people with you. So if you're trying to persuade or influence a board, an individual, a group, you keep them with you. And the way you do that is you imagine you're walking somebody through a, a, a maze. You know the idea, the old maze sits up them, right? And they're blindfolded. And all you've got to keep with, all you can keep them with you is your voice. You can't touch them, but you can talk to them. So you're blindfolded and they're blindfolded. And what you say to them is you say, does that make sense? Do you understand? We're going to turn left here. Are you with me? Are you happy with that? And we call them tags, little tag questions. So if you tag somebody with you all of the time, by the time you get to the end of any kind of conversation, there's a good chance they'll stay with you. For example, if you're saying to the board, we think it's a good idea to put a new sprinkler system in. John's proposed that you've said it. What do you think about that, Nigel? What do you think, Mel? What do you think about it, Claire? And they'll say, yeah, we think it's a good idea. They're with you. You take a next step. When we've looked at 14 different options, anybody think we should look at any more? Yes or no? They're with you. Whereas if you go, we're just going to read through the board minutes of last month's meeting, and we've looked at 14 things, and we've done this, and blah, blah, blah. next thing you know, you've been banging on for half an hour, you've lost them. But if you ask questions to keep people with you, by the time you get to the end of the presentation, nobody could have fallen asleep, drifted off, gone mobile phone alert, you know, and they're just on their phone. They've stayed with you. So you always make sure that you tag with them with you and you ask the questions to get the right answers. Then there's a really good chance that you'll get yes to what you want to get them to. It's a say it, doubt it rule where if I say it, you'll doubt it. But if you get other people to say it, then, yeah, as you said earlier, they're not going to argue with themselves. 
they won't they won't argue with themselves and we can't argue with ourselves especially in this country so we spoke about the principles of influence earlier and um, in the uk the strongest influence principle is the principle of consistency my word is my bond if i said i'll do it i'll do it in germany can you guess what the strongest influence principle is over there would it be germany authority no it's actually consistency i suppose that'd be more like that, that, that consistency it's okay consistency. i suppose authority would be more in like in um the far east wouldn't it yeah it is authority isn't there but in germany it's is what you're saying consistent with the rules of the organization here it's consistent with CCRs. Yeah. What, what about in spain so if we said to spain Right. What's the strongest principle there? The strongest influence principle is a principle of liking. Do my peers, my friends like you? In America, it's reciprocity. America, America gave people land and they, you know, and they gave them, you know, a, an opportunity. They're saying, look, if you need us to fight for you, we want you to fight for you. Right. So the, the influence principles are stronger depending on which continent you're dealing with, depending on which, which, which people you're, you're working with. And, and they're really, really powerful. Yeah. It's, and as you say, it's knowing, yeah, which one you need to pull in based on where you're working or the situation and and the person as well. Different personality yeah. types are going to need. So you can ask questions. You're going to so you so when you start asking questions of people, we're going to say, well, okay, which kind of influence principle? If this person's from Asia, then you can maybe you think about the principle of authority. You think, what do the senior people need to achieve in this organisation? What are the senior leaders in there that they think? I think, well, this is what our big goal is. They want to be consistent with that. But if they're going to look at the voices, the opinions of those people. So they're the first people you need to get on board first. If you're in Asia and you're trying to persuade a golf club, that's what it's going to be. If it's in Spain, you need to make friends with people. If it's in Germany, you need them to be consistent. So anyway, it's fun. It's fun the world over. But influence works and it's a really, really powerful system and way to communicate with people to get them to say yes to you, to your idea, to your business, or to maximize the opportunity, the chances of them saying yes to you. But if you haven't got the right mental attitude, then guess what? You won't learn the system and you won't do the work. And so if you don't do any of those things, then guess what happens? You don't learn it. Yeah, I mean, I've gone through this review in the past and I love it. I find it really interesting to learn and I've found it very useful in my life and it's definitely helped me move the needle towards where I want things to go. So it's been, I, mean, I personally can't re recommend it enough as a subject for people to want to learn more about for themselves or maybe for the team. So if people wanted to do that, what would be maybe a really easy low calorie entrance into it and what would be kind of someone really wanted to dive deep and, and learn learn it or, or get the teams onto it, what would you recommend? So, so uh, because we're doing this podcast, I've never done it before, but because it's you, Ed, we, we're friends. Um, if the guys drop me an email to david at suada, S-U-A-D-A dot com, then I'll give them a course on the principle of reciprocity on my platform. I've got a learning platform called Suada where they can learn about the principle of reciprocity and you know, and whatever I can send them some more information about other things they can learn. Um, but yeah, that'd be a great thing to do when you understand these principles, when you start to understand about framing and negotiation, it's really, really powerful. And obviously we run courses on these things, you know, um, what helps is when you get people having the right mental attitude and you train them on it at, uh, at outset, you teach them how to pre-frame in the right way. You teach them how to reframe in the right way. You teach them how to use influence ethically and effectively. You teach them how to negotiate, use Socratic questioning. What you'll find is that everybody starts to say yes to them. Yes, 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 yes. And, you know, obviously if you're running a business and it's a sales type business, then that's what's most important. But if they drop me an email to david at suada, S-U-A-D-A dot com, then I'll put them onto the free reciprocity course and they can start to learn a little bit about this stuff. And if they like it, then great. And if not, then no big deal. I'm sure they will though. Oh, thank you. That's very generous, David, to do that. And say I've gone through Suada and I think one of the things that I enjoyed about it the most is that with online learning, sometimes you just, you feel like you're, you're just reading, taking stuff, but you're not necessarily learning. What I really like about your approach is the making the mind map for the subject you've learned, then creating a video, talking through it, and then getting feedback from a human, whether you have actually really grasped it or not. And I found that, I mean, I've used that for lots of other stuff since then uh, as a way for myself learning. So I think that's a great way that you have blended online learning because I think as, as companies, if people wanted to send their sales teams on this course, 
and he's spending the money on it. You want to know they're actually learning. Yes. And, and, and this is, for me, it's got that powerful element of utilizing online anytime, anywhere in the world with, with this human engagement of, yes, you're learning or not. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the teach back is the key function of our um, platform in the it's social learning. You'll get coached. And so for each of the people that want to come through, I'll give them some coaching so they understand the principle and also how to apply it to the life. And it will make a massive difference. I guarantee you, if you're trying to motivate people to move in your direction, understanding it and embracing technology, it makes all of a difference. And you, I, I couldn't sum up the platform better than you've done it. You've done it exactly right. It's not about clicking videos and watching next. It's about understanding it then creating a mind map, then teaching it back, then looking to see what your peers have done. And it's like, okay, I'll get this. It makes sense. David, thank you for your, t- for your time today. I've really enjoyed this conversation and, and hopefully everyone listening has got a lot from it. And again, I can't recommend enough to people to learn about this subject and to take up your generous offer. So thank you. Yeah, fan- fantastic, Ed. Thank you. Have a fantastic Friday. Whatever you're doing over the weekend, enjoy it. And uh, guys and girls, if you want me, drop me a note, david at suede.com. More than happy to help get involved and uh, share some magic. Perfect. And I'll make it in the show notes. I'll put all these details for people to see as well. Perfect. Thanks, my friend. I'll see you soon. Thank you for joining me on this journey as we dive into the world of club management. I hope you enjoy listening to these conversations as much as I enjoy having them. If you do enjoy and get value from them, I have two small requests. Simply subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast listening app and leave a review and share it directly with someone whom you think would benefit from listening. If you're interested in being a guest on this show yourself, then you can reach out to me using the details in the show notes or email me modern club management at pm.me in the show notes you will also find a link to my bi-weekly newsletter that complements these conversations where you can sign up to receive these directly into your inbox so that you never miss out thanks for tuning in and have an amazing day